Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So we've been reading from the Gospel according to Mark over the last several weeks. We've been reading of how Jesus has healed many people, how he's calmed the, the wind and the waves. Last week, how he stopped a 12-year flow of blood and he raised a little girl from death. He showed his dominion, if you will, over all of creation, over disease, and over our greatest enemy, death. Now, there is a, a, a portion in there that we skipped over a couple of different things. One of them, if you'll recall, Jesus went across the lake, the Sea of Galilee. And on the other side, it didn't, we didn't read about what he did, but there he cast out that legion of demons from a man who lived among the tombs. It seems, you know, as we read all the, these things, there's nothing that Jesus can't do. Nothing that's not within his power until today. When it seems that Maybe Jesus can't do everything. Is it just because he's now home in Nazareth? Is it just because he's now here with all of these people with whom he grew up? Those that know him so well and have known him all of his life. I would say that yes, that is part of it. They think they know him so well that they know that he can't do these things. They doubt from the innermost part of their being. This, they look at him and say, is one that has grown up among us. If I can't do it, then I know he can't do it either. For those that, that were here last week, right? We had Pastor Brazina with us assisting and then he spoke during the coffee hour. And if you weren't downstairs, hopefully you got to view it on Facebook or on YouTube. But one of the things that Pastor Brezina brought up is the fact that he now serves in a congregation where he has been all of his life, essentially. He grew up in that congregation, and everybody there, all the old members, they've known him all of his life. They still think of him, if you will, as little Davy. You know, that, that, that boy that, yeah, he was cute, but boy, wasn't he mischievous also. And as a result, he did say that there were some that didn't look at him as their pastor. He wasn't their pastor. I would say that's tragic. For here, as, as, as they look at him, it's, they, they don't accept what he says as a pastor, which means they're not accepting the, the absolution that he pronounces. And it's not that they're simply rejecting, let's say, little Davy. They're not even rejecting Pastor Brazina. In doing so, they're rejecting the one by whose authority Pastor Brazina does speak. So in our text, Jesus, you know, we're early in Mark's gospel, but still, Jesus has been on the road for some time now. He's been, the notoriety of his name has gotten around. The word has gone out and circulated throughout all of the countryside, throughout Galilee, of how, you know, well he teaches. That he's not just a, a well-spoken individual, but he speaks with authority. And the word has gotten out that he does great signs and wonders from healing fevers and all manner of illnesses to taming even creation when it decides to act up. He forces the demons to obey him. And he reverses what no other man can reverse. That is death. Yet, he still Mary's son. He's still the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And he still has his sisters that live here among us. 
If we put ourselves in the, in the mind, if you will, of the people of Nazareth, we look out the window and we say, that's where he grew up. He's just, he grew up just two doors down from us. He played with my children. He played with your children. I even remember the time that, you know, I couldn't quite get my front door closed and it creaked and everything else. Boy, he is a fantastic carpenter. He came over and he had it working in no time. And every afternoon, you know, when I go walking around getting my exercise, it's all those houses, that new development, you know, on the side of town. Those are the ones that he built. The fancy, the nice ones, right? I bet you they all respected him. For he is certainly a man that people would respect. But respect is not the same as faith. It is not the same that, as faith that looks to him and trusts that what he says is true, that what he declares is factual. And that what he says will happen, does happen. It's not the same as faith that looks to him and believes that he is the son of God come to save them. It's not even the kind of faith that trusts that he's even a prophet. In two weeks, we're going to have a voters meeting. An assembly after the 1015 service on Sunday. And there's going to be some form of a resolution as part of that meeting put before the congregation concerning the training and the subsequent calling of John Hutchins as an associate pastor. Should the congregation go ahead and vote, yes, we want to do this and take on this plan, all of you will have to learn to regard John a little differently. For while he may be and might always still be in some people's minds nothing other than little Johnny, or for most of us maybe that young fellow that has such a fine looking family, right? But he will become something different through that call. And we will all need to see him as a pastor of this congregation. One who has been vested with the authority of the gospel. One who has been called to administer those things that are proper to the office of the holy ministry. A ministry for which he would be called. Now he may always be little Johnny, but according to the call he would receive, he would proclaim the word of Jesus. He would exercise the keys and he would administer the sacraments. And thus he would do publicly the things of Jesus. And he would do them for the benefit of this congregation. St. Paul wrote in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians how pastors are to be regarded as stewards of the mysteries. Well, in Nazareth, even the owner of the mysteries was shut down. He was not listened to, and he was prevented from healing those that just knew him a little bit too well, I guess. Perhaps they thought that if such was within his power, then why hasn't he been doing this all of his life? <clears throat> Why has he waited until now to bring this authority home? Well, as the saying goes, right, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Jesus had brought home his teaching. He had brought home his miracles to Nazareth. But the obstinance of those town folk, their refusal to believe, prevented them from receiving the very thing that he brought to them. He brought them life. And because it was Jesus, they refused 
to receive that life. They refuse to believe. And as our text now says, they are known, if you will, for their unbelief. That even Jesus would marvel over such unbelief. It would be much better if he were to marvel over their great faith rather than their tremendous unbelief. But even as Paul writes in our epistle today, right, it, so it is with those who bring the gospel. Too many have some reason, I would say, to protest against the power of the gospel to save, no matter who speaks it. There is always some basis to reject what is offered. And so without faith, the word of forgiveness falls, if you will, on deaf ears. It's not received, even though it is offered to everybody. It is because this gospel is for everybody that the church is always on the move, just as Jesus sends out his disciples in our text, two by two, where he gives them the very same authority over the unclean spirits as he himself has exercised. He sends them out to tell of a Savior, one that can bring restoration to their lives, both in body and in soul. And this is the very, the very same ministry, I would say, that we possess. It is what we also have been entrusted with. It is the ministry in which we are sent out together, if you will, as a pair, as a pastor and a congregation, much in the same way as the disciples themselves were sent out. We have preachers and we have hearers. We have those that administer holy baptism and we have those that diligently and earnestly bring their young ones to such a great gift. We work together in this way, exercising the authority of Jesus over unclean spirits and handing over the Holy Spirit who works faith and life eternal. We are, the, like the disciples, the church that is in motion. Now, while she may have a local congregation that is the church, she might have a fixed presence in the community. The church is always sending. The church is always being sent. The church is always in motion as she carries the gospel to others. You know, we've heard of shoestring budgets, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about there. But it seems that the disciples in this instance weren't even given the shoestring. They were dependent solely upon the word of Jesus. They were dependent solely upon those to whom they were sent. If their message was rejected, they simply were to shake the dust off of their feet and to move on. If there was none to receive them, they continued their mission until somebody did receive them. I believe that we do have a similar opportunity before us. That is, an opportunity to carry the gospel to new areas and to support those who work in the field. It requires faith. Faith to go out without all of the things that we would normally take. This being 4th of July weekend, right? A lot of people on the road. And I bet you just about everybody that hit the road packed a bag. They made a few sandwiches and put in their cooler to take along with them. We're not the type to go out and do things without preparation. So it is a journey that I would say that is done in faith. For a congregation to train a man for the holy ministry and to work towards the establishment of, of the gospel and word and sacrament ministry in, in new locations, especially when the current budget, I would say, is sparse, one that has no room to wiggle, is a great leap of faith. It will take faith on the part of Redeemer Lutheran Church and on the part of all of her members 
that the gospel that we possess is even the gospel that causes demons to flee by one little word. That it is the gospel that restores those to the fullness of humanity before God through the waters of holy baptism. And that it is the gospel that sustains the Christian, that sustains the church on its way with the heavenly manna of Christ's body and blood. It will take faith on the part of, of uh, on our part to receive that which has been given to us and to, to take a step out and to share it with the surrounding villages and towns. It will take faith to step out into that unknown without guarantees of success and to do so with a tight budget. It will take faith to believe that no matter how much effort we put forward, and no matter how much we give in that effort, what we have and what we possess is never diminished. We have the greatest riches in the world. If we combine all the wealth, let's say, of all of these new billionaires that are seem to be created every day, we could not purchase what we already have for ourselves in the spilled blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For there we have true forgiveness and we have lasting reconciliation with God. Something that cannot be taken away, something that cannot be made even less than us, no matter how much of it is also given away. So I don't know how close we are to having a, a resolution, if you will, to, to send out for the congregation to deliberate. And I obviously make no bones about my opinion on that. Uh, I'm, I'm, that I think it is the thing that for us to do. But I also recognize that it's not the only thing for us to do. And that the, the heart of the congregation is what matters in this respect. And uh, but as Jesus sends the disciples, so he does send us and we are to do something, let's say. And if it's not this, then we will find something else. And I got a thumbs up from Paul. So the resolution is coming forward to the congregation soon for deliberation. So what I want to leave you with is a benediction. That God would, do, would uh, guide your deliberations that he would guide your prayers in preparation, if you will, for this voters meeting. That he would give you a peace in what you think and, and what you believe to be the right way forward. A peace that passes understanding as he keeps your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.